unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. This week, I want to bring a conversation that the Lord has been having with me. And it began with a conversation on how um, we have been placed in a world that is already so out of order because of the fallen nature of man and the fallenness of the dispensation because of Satan's work in breaking our relationship with God when he uh, tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. And so something has been hitting my spirit continuously about the conversations that sometimes we find ourselves engaged in because of the world that we are in as believers, because of the things that have surrounded us and have filled our experiences in life. And you've had, I believe, for those of you who understand the way life goes, you've had conversations such as, you cannot tell the future. Eh? In the future, something bad can happen, something negative could happen, something unexpectedly disastrous could happen. You, you cannot tell the future, okay? And because you cannot tell the future, you know, we are never ready for certain things in the future. Something can happen. And because of that kind of conversation, some people even prepare for the worst that could happen in the future. They have created and provided uh, for experiences of failure, of disaster, of mayhem, of mischief in their future. Okay, and much as this wisdom seems, you know, collectively right because it's a conversation that the world has, unfortunately, even Christians are swept unawares into those kinds of conversations. And then you also hear them say the same things that the world says because we do not understand. The Bible says that we perish for a lack of knowledge. And because of that, some people have provided for the kind of future of mayhem, of mischief, of disaster that they have prepared for because they were pre-wired, pre-configured in thought and action to behave that way, okay? And so tonight I felt led by the Spirit of God to engage us in that kind of conversation. When you are a believer, what do you think of the days to come for you? What do you think of the life ahead for you? What do you think of the things to come touching your life touching your destiny, touching your story. As a believer, again, notwithstanding that we have had tests, we have had trials, okay? We have had things that have come and hit us, not only those of you who are listening to me, but the body of Christ at large, okay? And some people accept those kinds of things and have put it into a day doctrine of the Christian faith as though to expect and prepare and act a certain way towards those things. And we miss the mark in the understanding of the way God works, the way God functions. Um, so when you start conversations touching, you know, human life experience, touching our existence, you're talking of life to death, you know, somebody's born and they're a child and they grow up and then they die. Okay, life to death. You're talking of strength to weakness. As they're younger, they're energetic. You've had conversations of old men when they say, ah, you know, you, you're younger, you're stronger. When you grow older, you become a bit weaker, okay? And so it is from strength to weakness, okay? From life to death, you know, from positive to negative, from light to darkness you know, from success to failure. It's just the trend of the way the world interprets human life. And even as Christians, we have started to accept what the world gives us 
And sadly, we now get those and preach them as doctrines in the body of Christ as of to say that that is the mind of God touching humanity. But I came to break that. I came to debunk that. I came to challenge it by scripture, to show you the mind of God touching our future. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, in the beginning, the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says, and the earth was without form and void. And the Bible says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now the third verse says, and God said, let there be light. And the Bible says there was light. The fourth verse says, and God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Watch the fifth verse. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Listen to the mind of God. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. So you have to first go back into God's mind to see the pattern of creation, to understand through scripture God's intention, God's opinion, God's idea about how earth and everything within is supposed to move and exist, okay? The Bible says in Genesis, he separated light and darkness. He called the light day and then he separated it and called the darkness night. And the Bible says, and the evening and morning were the first day. Mark, he did not say, and the morning and evening were the first day. No, he said, and the evening, which is dark, dusk, and morning were the first day. That means in God's creation pattern, evening was created before morning. Darkness, okay, existed before light. The order of God is that darkness exists before light. Light does not exist before darkness. No, he created the light. And when he gets it into the realm of days, when he puts it into the realm of days, it is first evening, okay, and then morning. And then the Bible says, and that was the first day. So you see, if even in the mind of God, darkness precedes light. He sees a place where he will bring a light out of darkness. It's not the place of light into darkness. It is a place of darkness into light. But you see, but the world lives their days from light into darkness, from life into death, from strength into weakness, you know, from victory and goodness into despair and failure. That's how the world sees life. That's how the life of man is. Why? Because we are still dealing with a fallen sort. We cannot import that into the church and preach that as doctrine because then we affect negatively the expectation of believers. Remember, he says, I know the plans that I have for you. He says, plans to make you prosper and not to harm you. He has thoughts of peace, the Bible says, and not of evil. And the next line says, and to give you an expected end. Now, if we are telling men that you come from life into death, okay, it means you are affecting their expectation even from God. If you tell men that they begin from strength into weakness, it means you are affecting their expectation from God. Remember, people can only work as far as their expectation. The power of expectation is not something to be overlooked when it comes to the way of faith. Remember the lame man at the temple called beautiful. The Bible says he was crippled in both feet. And the Bible says, and they carried him, and the Bible says he beheld them, right? He looked at these apostles expecting something from them. He was expecting something from them, to receive something of them. That's Acts 3, 5. But you see, when the Bible says he was expecting to receive something of them, maybe he was expecting maybe money, maybe bread for that hour, maybe a coin. But because he had an expectation of something, 
thing, the power of expectation allowed him as a man to receive from the anointing that was before him. You never underestimate the power of expectation. And our responsibility as the body of Christ, particularly as ministers, is to preach the gospel in a way where the expectations of the believers meet the expectations of God. And what are the expectations of God? That the thoughts that he has towards you are thoughts of peace and not evil. They are thoughts to give you an expected end and not an end of destruction. People must know that the God who promises these things also has the full ability to fulfill. God is powerful. We cannot continue saying in the body of Christ, oh, with God all things are possible, when we cannot justify that statement. I think that's one of the most disrespectfully mentioned statements, more so by religious people. I'm talking about people with a spirit of religion. And the spirit of religion can be on a Pentecostal, can be on a Baptist, can be on anybody. Okay? When the Bible says that with God all things are possible, why did he present possibility to his own? Why would he say whatsoever you ask when he had not provided for enough power for whatever we ask for to come to pass? Why did he tell us whosoever shall say when he did not avail enough power for the activation of our faith? Now we're living in a generation where we are trying to redefine God to a big part of a generation that has not really received the full revelation of the person of God. And so some things are just so good to be true. They are just so good to be acceptable as those that befit people of this faith. But yet the Bible does not change. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? And that is why I want to use scripture to help some of us. Because many people have a very insecure future. That even their conversation are insecure. Their thoughts of the future are insecure. They are bleak. Their thoughts of life is hopeless. It is hopeless. Why? Because the world does not have hope. And it has shed this hopelessness into the church, into the body of Christ. All right? They have lived a life to death experience as human beings for long. They have lived a strength to weakness experience for a long time that they have come not only to accept it, but to love it. Yet they do not know that that's the foundation of evil. That's the essence of evil. That's the mind of Satan to still kill and destroy. Right? John 3.19 says that this is the record, this is the mind. This is the condemnation. He said that the light is come into the world and men, the Bible says, love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men, people of this world, love darkness. They love darkness. How can they love darkness? Because their hearts are already taken into accepting darkness, into accepting the way of darkness, because that's what evil does in the heart of a man. When evil sits in the heart of a man, it causes that man to love darkness. It causes that man to accept what is dark, what is unacceptable before God. Now, the Bible says that the light has come into the world, and that light has come through the person of Jesus Christ. It has come through the glorious gospel. Because Christ is the word. He's the one that becomes flesh and we behold his only glory as the only true son of God, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. But the Bible says men have loved this darkness. But the light is come. But men love to be in the dusk. They love to be in the darkness. Because they have lived it for so many years. It has evolved for so many years that it has become part of the accepted norm of human experience. That we fail, that we go into darkness, that we die a certain way, that destruction is expected and anticipated. And so even when men are projecting of the future, prospecting of anything that should come even in planning, many of them plan for a certain darkness ahead. They plan for a certain failure ahead. They plan for a certain discrepancy ahead. Why? Because that's just the way men of this world are. But that is not how God has called the Christian. And the believer. These things seem like they're light. 
But when you put them back into perspective to ask yourself why the biggest percentage of Christians are not living the glorious life that was given us in Christ, you will realize that it goes back to these, albeit simple, elementary things, but are taken lightly because people do not know the power behind these things. They do not know the power behind these things. The Bible says in Peter that you are a royal priesthood. That's Peter 2.9. A chosen generation. A peculiar people, he said. That you, the Bible says, should, not might, not could. No, he says that you should show forth the praises of him, the Bible says, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of the evening days into the morning light. That is why you were called. That is why you are born again. That is why you are a chosen generation. That's the purpose of your choosing. That's the gist of why you are a royal priesthood. That is what makes you peculiar. What makes you peculiar is that as the world has accepted darkness as part of their lives, he has called you that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. Show forth that everything you do should show that you are not a child of darkness. You do not belong to darkness, that you were called out of darkness and that you are now in the marvelous light. In the marvelous light. In the marvelous light. That's what he has called you and I to do. We should show forth. It is not of might or... No, it is a should show forth. It's not, oh, you know, some of those that are gifted, you know, some people like apostle so-and-so and prophet and teacher so-and-so and pastor so-and-so. For them, God prepared this for them. But, you know, for me, um, disadvantaged, am I lucky? You know, for them, they're like that. For us, we're like this. And then you start giving excuses, you know, for why you are not living the life full. 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 A believer once came to me and said, I am tired. I want to commit suicide. I'm tired of poverty. He said tired of poverty. I want to kill myself. I'm tired of poverty. So out of curiosity, I asked him, how long have you lived with poverty? He says, I've not been employed for more than five years. I don't have this. I lost this. I don't have that. I've not this. And then he started, went on and on, because I was curious to know what's really the mind behind why this fellow was tired of life and wanted to kill himself. And so I asked him, so how long have you been born again? He said, I've been born again since I was little. I've been born again since I was little. I said, do you do the principles as given in scripture for your success financially? He says, like which ones? I said things like fast food and the rest. He said, no. So I asked him, so if you kill yourself, where is the justification of why you're going to kill yourself? Have you done what the word says since you were little and the word has failed you? And so because the word has failed you, therefore you find no other option except to commit suicide? Or, right now you are telling me, I am rebellious against the principles of God, of tithes and offerings and all. I'm rebellious of all that for all of these years, but I still expect him to perform or else I commit suicide. So I asked him. And the light went on. He understood what I was trying to say. So he asks me, what should I do? And I told him, for you, see, firstly understand, what is your real problem? Is your problem poverty? Because I tried to explain to him, and I helped him come to the understanding that his problem was not poverty. He thought his problem was poverty, but his problem was not poverty. His problem was the life of a man who wanted God to perform for him, yet he was against every principle in the area with which he expects God to perform for him. And now he has thrown a tantrum with God because God has not answered him and he hasn't seen answers. And so he wants to get rid of his life because of his own rebellion. 
this is money. I've just talked about finances. But there are many, many, many Christians across the world who are exactly like that. It might not be financial. It might be any other aspect of life. But that's just how they see life. Because some people have chosen to stay babes. In the time when they ought to be teachers, they've chosen to stay immature. They've chosen to set themselves against the wills and purposes of God. They've refused to align themselves to the patterns of the Spirit, yet yearn for the revelation of the mystery, the demystification of this mystery. And yet, you know, the way of the Spirit has proved that the mystery is a more complicated experience when a man has not met the pattern first. Patterns precede the demystification of this mystery. Because God has called us to learn in stages. Okay? You learn one thing and then you go into the next stage and then you go into the next stage. You learn in one phase into another and then you grow in one stage into another. You learn in phases, you grow in stages. It's a pattern of our faith. But what then does God have to do with us when we refuse to grow? What does God do with a believer who refuses to grow? Who refuses to align themselves to the truth that he has given you, yet you know that this is the truth you should know, and the truth, the Bible says, will make you free. Some of us, what we think are our problems are not actually our problems. And it takes great wisdom in God to know exactly what your challenge really is. Because some people even pray the wrong prayer. Why? Because they think their problem is one thing and yet their problem is another. And I helped this young man understand his problem was the love for money. He loved money so much that he could not do the principles of God. And now he wants to commit suicide because things are not working for him. It's because he has set himself against the principles of God. And the reason why he set himself against the principles of God is because he loves the money. So he cannot give as the principles require of him. Jesus Christ is supposed to be the easiest thing to understand. The easiest person to understand. The person of Christ is supposed to be the easiest individual to study and leave out, even the Christian faith. But how many Christians say, oh, you know, Christianity is hard. Oh, don't tell me. Christianity, oh, Christianity is a very hard life. Do you think it's easy to live born again? Or do you think it is easy to serve? Or do you think it's easy to preach? Or do you think it's easy to be a man of God? For them, everything is just failure, failure, darkness, 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 because that's the world has given us. But see what the Bible has said. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, so you should show forth the praises of him. That means we don't have an excuse not to show God. As a believer, there is no excuse you have to say, I have failed to do this. And this even might go to some of the most complicated things of life. Because many of us have been built to be victims and not victors. It's now the church we're dealing with. People line up every day, a pastor help me, I'm a victim, pray for me about this, pray for me about this, break this, rebuke this, this one is disturbing me, pray. You're always a victim in the life of Christianity. And some people live that life until the day of their death. Some have not had the opportunity to experience life this side of victory. But you don't have to be like that. You don't have to be like that. Again, you see the mind of God. The God who created first the evening and the morning, and that was the first day. He's the same God who called again you out of darkness, the Bible says, and he has now called you into his marvelous light to show forth praises, not failure. To show forth praises, not darkness. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe verses 4. He says, ye brethren, he says, are not in darkness. He said, ye are not in darkness. 
Remember Psalm 30 says, weeping may endure for a night because night is a place of failure. It's a place of weeping. It's a place of turmoil. It's a place of mischief. It's a place of misgiving. It's a place of challenge. It's a place of pain. It's a place of sorrow. He says, weeping may endure, but for a night, the Bible says, but joy, the Bible says, joy cometh in the morning. So when we're talking about darkness here, we're talking about everything evil, everything demonic, everything oppressive, everything destructive, everything that derails you from your joy, from your purpose and cause, anything that should destroy the cause with which you are called in Christ and frustrate you in life, that is darkness. And he said, weeping may endure for a night. It may endure for a night. Or for a moment. But the Bible says, joy cometh in the morning. It cometh. There's a joy that cometh in the morning. There's a joy that cometh in the morning. Now, let's go back to Thessalonians. He says, ye brethren, he says, are not in darkness. He says that the day should overtake you as a thief. But he says, but ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. He says, we are not of the night nor of darkness. He has repeated it again. He says, we are not of darkness. We are not of the night. Ye are children of the day. Ye are children of the day. You're children of joy. You're children of victory. You're children of mercy. You're children of grace. Your children of love, your children of beauty, your children of triumph, your children of victory, your children of every good thing which is in Christ. Ye are children of light. I'm a child of light. Say it, say I'm a child of light, not a child of darkness. In other words, my future is bright. My future is illuminated. My future is a future of light and not a future of darkness. That is regardless of what has been happening on my life. That is regardless of what the doctor could have said is your report. Whether they said you have six months to leave. Are you born again? I have good news for you. You don't have six months to leave. You have as long as you believe God to leave. Some people say, oh no, whatever he's saying is, he's really unrealistic. He doesn't understand life. Listen, the gospel is so foolish when we start comparing it to the way the world thinks. But therein, that foolishness is the life of God manifested and demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ. How do you live your life expecting darkness as a believer. Why would you live your life as a child of darkness, as a child of the night, yet you are a child of the day? He has said it. What God is trying to do here is to capture our expectations and arrest our consciousness to where we really belong in Christ. And that's the beginning of your warfare. That's the beginning of your warfare. Why did he give us the word that is preached? He gave you and I the word that is preached to help us stand in that light, in that day, in that morning, to keep us out of darkness and the night. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, 19, he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He says, where unto, he says, you do good the word, this word, scripture, to take heed of, to listen to. He says, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Did you hear that? The word is a light that shineth in a dark place. Oh, glory to God. That means when you read the Bible, it gives light to every place that could be dark around you. It is that light in a dark place. So, when you have the word of God, it means you do not and cannot and should not expect darkness near you. Why? Because you carry the light of the glorious gospel. 
And that light is in the face of Jesus Christ, who is in you. And now he says, ye are the light of the world. You became the day. You became that very light because you're a child of light. Now he says, we do good, listen, to take heed unto that word as a light that shineth, the Bible says, in a dark place until the day dawn. Listen, until the day dawn. Do you know what dawn is? The dawn is the first light of the day. Glory to God. The dawn is the first light of the day. That means you, you take it to this word as a light that shines in a dark place until that light of the day comes. That dawn, the Bible says the day dawns and the day star arise in your hearts. The day star arises in your heart. I wish many preachers understood 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 9. They would not be preaching the nonsense we hear many times on television and radio in the name of the gospel. When a man preaches the word, it must be a light in a place of darkness. It must not be a darkness in the darkness. And because we don't understand the order of that pattern, some people take these things lightly, but these things are very, very crucial. Because if we miss the order, the Bible says, a little leaven spoils the whole dough. In Galatians 5, he says, a little leaven, a little lump of leaven, the Amplified Bible, he says, it perverts the whole conception of faith and misleads the whole church. One little line of truth can pervert a man's heart life of faith in conception. One little idea of the greed of truth, the Bible says, can pervert the whole conception of faith. Some people's faith is shipwrecked because they were given a simple, because sometimes it's easy to mention, Jesus, he's the lamb and he is the lion. It's true. But was he firstly a lion before the lamb or was he firstly a lamb before a lion to us? on earth. He first came as a lamb to us. He came from weakness and then became a lion to us. He's both the lion and the lamb, but he came as a lamb first from weakness to strength, from death to life. He died for your sins and I. Okay, when he was nailed on the cross and then he breathed his life out and he gave up his ghost and he said, it is finished. He went into hell. He shook them and all, triumphing over all of them. And the Bible says he comes back in glory. He was raised from the dead, from death to life. That's why we sing the song, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Jesus never ended in death. He ended in life. And the Bible has given us the record that the Son, Jesus Christ, has life in him. And he that has the Son, the Bible says, has eternal life. Look at how our master did it. He did not end in death. No, he transcended death into life. He did not end into weakness. He transcended weakness and became strength. That is the Jesus that the church believes. That is the rock on which he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Men of God, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, we are supposed to be men that give light in the dark places. Are you hearing me? Until the day dawns. Until the day dawns. That means that even in the most dark places, light is supposed to be available because we are children of the day. Until the first light of dawn breaks through. That means even in the existence of night, we are not subject to that night. We are not in consequence to that night. We are not controlled by that night. In the midst of the night, we are still light shining. We are shining in dark places. Why? Because we are possessors of the word. The gospel is supposed to be a gospel of peace, not destruction. It is supposed to be a gospel of love. That is why I don't understand how someone can say that they are a preacher of the gospel, 
but spit darkness with their mouth. Not only about their lives, but about the life of other believers, other Christians, other men of God, other ministries, just to speak darkness. God has called us to speak light. That is why we ought to speak as the oracle of God, because God is light. That is the light that carries the life. Now, if we understand this, every time we preach the word to anybody that is listening to us, or for those of you who want to discern a true minister of the gospel, and someone who is simply, you know, wasting time. That's how you know it. Whenever they preach, do they give light in a dark place? Or do they continue to darken what is already dark? Do they define Christ in you, the hope of glory? Because that is the basis of the ministry of the church. This is the justifier of any man who preaches. That is why when we talk about the message of grace, it's not just a doctrine. The Bible says, the letter killeth. <laughs> the letter killeth. The letter killeth. So every time we read the letter, the Bible says, every time Moses is read, a veil comes over men's faces. Why? Because every time veils come over men's faces, Darkness is within the veils. But every time we preach the message of grace, we are proclaiming the light of the glorious gospel. Grace is not just a doctrine. Oh, you know, when you preach grace, you tell people to continue sinning. I told one man, how can we preach that and we're still on the air? Then he says, oh, no, maybe it's the way you say it that makes them interpret it the other way. And I said, no, 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 no. God cannot say one thing, okay, and men interpret it another way. No, God can say something and Satan, okay, convinces men another way, but the word in its own cannot be received wrongly because it comes with the purity and the power to change the hearts of men. The word in its own cannot come incorrupt and make a man corrupt. No. The Bible says men are led away by their own lusts, all right? They yield into the weakness of their carnal nature and open up doors for Satan to deceive them off the course. But it's not the word that misleads. That is why I tell people, even in this hour, more than ever before, if the world has never understood why we preach grace, they will understand grace. They will understand that it is the only light in darkness. For example, when you tell a man, you're going to hell. You're a sinner. All right? That is true. But that's not what changes the man. It's not what changes the man. There are people who know they're going to hell and are well made up to go. Hello? There are people who worship Satan and they're well made up to go to hell. And they're okay with it. They're okay with it. But the equal measure that moves any heart of a man is the revelation of this love of God, which is unconditional. It's that persuasion that gives us the foundation of our ministry, that regardless of what happens in your life, God loves you unconditionally. Do you know that if that statement finds somebody who has messed up so badly, it is the only light in their darkness. Just to know that God loves them unconditionally. It is the only light in their darkness. There are people right now who are loathing with sorrow because they have failed God. They have failed in life. Whatever they expected to be, they have not become. There's somebody, the way your life has turned out, it's so messed up. And you don't even know how you got where you are. You've had children out of wedlock. You've messed up. It was never your intention. You wish they understood your heart that it was never your intention. But unfortunately, you found yourself there. That is why people like me live. To help you understand that yes, you have made a mistake. And yes, 
God is forgiving and can and will forgive you. And you can move on, reconstruct your life, and be better than you were yesterday. You can change your story now. And by the power of faith, you can destroy any consequences of your past. Because Satan has no right to bring back what God has forgotten. He's the God who said that I'll forgive your sins. I'll throw them to the ends of the earth and I'll remember them no more. I remember them no more. It is the power of salvation. It is the glory. It is the glory of this person called Jesus Christ. It is the perfection that we yearn for even as children of God to get into that unity of perfection in the person of Jesus Christ. Where we all things are become new as we are in Christ. He says, and all things now become of God. All things become of God. All things become of God. How can we take our eyes off that kind of reality and truth and look at any other thing except this? How can we preachers, ministers, teachers of the gospel teach doom, yet the love of God, the grace of God is available, is in scripture, and he has showed us the pattern, light in the place of darkness until the day dawn, until that morning comes into the hearts of men and the dester rises in their hearts. In other words, the essence of the word is to keep you lit until your whole being is fully lit by reason of truth. That is why when you don't understand that, you will never understand our liberties in Christ. Because that's the sole foundation of the spirit of liberty. The spirit of liberty is the grace of understanding for the man to stay in the light in the day and never to go back to darkness. So am I saying that your future is securely bright? Yes, it is, 100% and so. Do not wake up any day to expect anything wrong to happen. Remove that mentality out of your head. Things can come and shake you now that might want to present a dead end of a future. But I tell people, that's the beginning of your warfare. Because you are a child of light. You're not a child of darkness, of night. You are a child of the day. He said, weeping may endure for night. But he says, but the child of the day is an expector of joy. He's an expector of victory. He's an expector of success. He's an expector of great things to come concerning our salvation. So they speak in your future. Okay? They speak in your future. Oh, you know, we expect bad days to come. We've been hearing on television, you know, people standing on television saying, in different countries, of course, they say, oh, you know, this coming week is going to be the worst, scientists say. And you know, some people simply accept it. Mm, yeah, it's going to be the worst. Yeah, let the world accept it. But that is the point where a believer comes in and says, I refuse that in the name of Jesus. If men should take it, let them take it, but that's not my portion in Christ. Some of you, you like following news eh, that project financial falls, you know, stock exchange markets because you invested money is there. Oh, let me look at this. I'm told that real estate is going down and yet I've invested in real estate. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. You've gotten back into the trap of life to death, of strength to weakness, of victory and triumph to despair. First, the Bible says evening and then morning and the first day was. God created darkness first for the evening and then introduced the light in the morning for a reason, for a reason. That every time we open our mouth to preach the gospel, to share the word even with those that are around us, it should always be that light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn. That means it's to keep men in the light, even in the most dark experience. Until the day dawn and the death star rises in our hearts. We are supposed to keep in the light. That's the liberty, the spirit of liberty. 
The spirit of liberty is the understanding, that understanding of the grace of God that sustains you in this glorious light. I expect great days ahead of me, regardless. I expect peace ahead of me, regardless. I expect victory ahead of me, regardless. Because that's what I was called to. That's what I was called to. You know, it's okay to accept this when everything is going right. But even in your worst darkness, it's a choice to believe God that my liberties of the Spirit can only dictate faith in the expectation of light for as long as I live because I'm a child of God, because I'm a believer. Because if we don't understand these liberties in the Spirit, we'll never understand faith, the doctrine. We'll never understand grace, the doctrine. We'll never understand the love, agape, the love which is of God. We'll never carry those understandings. We'll have opinions of this world, or we'll only excel to the abilities of our giftings, but we'll never go beyond in the understanding of these realities in God. Yet God has called you to transcend. There is a life in God that is bigger than even the most anointed gift. And it's in the realm of understanding. It's in the realm of revelation. Sometimes I wish that some people could be carried to certain places to have a certain understanding of the vastness of the depths of the riches of the glory of Christ. Paul said it. He said, oh, the depths of the riches of the glory of God. It's an amazing experience for your eyes to open, to see just how much all this depth is for your advantage that you will not live another day on earth disadvantaged. You're going to come out of this period better than the way you entered it. Because the path of the just shines brighter and brighter and to a perfect day. You're going to have a better month next month. You're going to have a better year. When this period began, I went on my knees and I said, God, I thank you because I'm going to have the most successful ministry of my life ever since I was born. I'm not saying that this is the greatest ahead. No, I'm saying from now till back from the time I was born, the moment we entered this season, I said this is going to be the most remarkable year than all the years that I've spent in ministry before me. Why? Because I'm a child of the day. I'm a child of the light. I expect good. I expect good. So wherever you are, I want you to open your mouth right now. I want you to speak words in the air. Make confessions right now. Start speaking forth in the atmosphere. Speak loud. Speak touching your finances, speak touching your ministry, speak touching your marriage, speak touching your children, speak touching your career, speak touching your aspirations, speak touching your dreams, speak touching your expectations. Say in the name of Jesus, I'm a child of light and not of darkness. I'm a child of the day and not of the night. I was not called to weep, I was not called to suffer, I was not called to fail in this life. Say, I was called to be a victor in the mighty name of Jesus. Say, I'm more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens me. Greater days await me. The worst has already happened. The best is yet to come. Greater is he which is in me than he that is in the world. I carry the light of the glorious gospel. It's inside my spirit and it is working for my good. Everything is working for my good. Everything is working and aligned to give me joy, to give me peace, to give me health, to give me victory. Say I am healthy from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Say I am wise with the wisdom of God. Say I am favored and favor is upon me as a mantle. Say the grace of God surrounds every 
everything that touches me. Say in the name of Jesus, success is mine. In the name of Jesus, the atmosphere is preparing for my progression. The atmosphere is preparing for my success. The atmosphere is preparing for my next best thing, for my next achievement. In the name of Jesus, the earth is groaning, it is shifting, and it is shaking for my next victory. In the mighty name of Jesus, and there is nothing the devil can do. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and believe. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Rosa talapa. Kebra katalapa ye. Jori kebra kazalando robo shakatalapa. Kora bazalaba yeke. Jire ketele payaraba. So when things come and they shake you, say, I'm a child of the day. I'm a child of light and not the night. In the mighty name of Jesus. I'm not called to fail in this. I'm called for success in this. In the mighty name of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you speak it a million times. It doesn't matter whether you speak it 20,000 times, but you have to speak it. You have to believe it. You have to see it. When you start doing those things, every time you open the Bible, you'll see light. Every time you open the word, you will see light. Pastors, let's give light in these dark days. I had a man saying, oh, you know, COVID, God is judging us. That is why COVID virus is here. I was like, oh my God. You mean the world is at its most wicked? No. Will God destroy a whole nation when there's one righteous man? Would he destroy a whole nation when there is one righteous man? Scripture tells us no. I believe, yes, this season is going to draw us back to God. But I don't look at it as judgment. Even some of the most born again believers have died. Across the world. Let's give light in these dark places in the mighty name of Jesus. So if you're there and you're watching me and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you want to, just repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the light that comes in these dark days. I receive you as my Lord and Savior with the faith in my heart that you died for my sins was raised for my glory. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.